perfection. Nothing in this world is truly perfect. You could have just watched the best movie ever, or played the best game ever, and I'd bet there would still be a few things that you wish were done better. And Pokemon games are no different. Although fun and formulaic, each Pokemon game appears to have at least one major shortcoming that we all wish could be fixed in some manner. Whether it's Johto's team building issues, Hoenn's water, Sinnoh's sluggish gameplay, or any other number of things, every game appears to have some sort of unignorable flaw. Well, all except for one. Pokemon's fifth generation is a tale of two extremes, from one of the most widely hated generations to one of the most beloved. Pokemon Black and White would serve as a soft reboot of the series, taking Pokemon back to its roots with a brand new setting disconnected from everything we'd known before. It was a bold risk that left many veteran fans feeling alienated from the series, but now history looks back at this choice more favorably. Another bold choice Game Freak made in this generation was the decision to abandon the traditional third enhanced version in favor of sequels that continued the story from Black and White and expanded on the region of Unova. Game Freak could have done what they've always done and dipped their hands back into the cookie jar for a few extra million dollars, but truthfully, Black and White were very polished compared to previous generation launching titles. They didn't really need that new coat of paint for $40. And the producers felt that making a Pokemon Grey would actively go against the themes laid down by the originals. And so, two years later in 2012, Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 were released. Featuring a new story, new characters, new locations, and an expanded Pokedex that included Pokemon from previous regions. Above all else, it felt like Black 2 and White 2 attempted to bridge the gap between people who really liked the fresh new experience that Unova offered, and people who liked a more traditional Pokemon experience focused on the adventure rather than the story. Admittedly, although I feel like Black and White's story is far superior to this game's story, I do think this game strikes a better balance between narrative and exploration. Sure, these games are still very linear, which was a big complaint that some fans had with Black and White, but that's also just the way that most modern Pokemon games are. At the very least, I would say like Black and White, this game's linearity is at least in service of a decent narrative. There are tons of other Pokemon games just as linear as this one with barren stories that don't really require linear progression. Looking at you again, X and Y, Sword and Shield. Compared to Black and White, there are far fewer breaks for exposition and dialogue here. The only particularly egregious break in this game, I would say, is the forced Pokestar Studios tutorial after the second gym, but that's just 10 minutes of my life that I won't get back. It's not an issue that affects a large portion of the game. Additionally, the routes and other locations get massive expansions that feel more in line with what you'd see in regions like Hoenn or Sinnoh, but like Black and White, there are far fewer HMs required for navigation. Discounting Cut, which you only really need for the first leg of the game, and Waterfall, which is scarcely used at all, the only HMs you really need to explore most of Unova are Strength and Surf. Compared to the 7 or 8 required HMs in previous regions, I can't overstate how much of a welcome change this was. Even cities like Castelia get massive updates with the sewer system that can lead to a secret central park area where you can catch Eevee, or the Relic Passage which connects the sewers to the Relic Castle to Driftvale City. There really is no shortage of things that do between story beats in this game, as each new area is jam-packed with side content. Even if it's still linear, there are tons of opportunities across Unova to open up your world. On top of that, things like Day of the Week events and Seasons also carry over from Black and White and are expanded further here, incentivizing you to backtrack and explore the same area multiple times in hopes of finding something new. Similar to the real-world New York City which Unova is based on, in these games it truly feels like the world never sits still. It's a living, breathing world in almost every aspect. Of course, I would say that's greatly aided by the satisfying art style of Gen 5 in general. Naturally, as the last 2D sprite-based generation, this serves as the pinnacle of Pokémon's art style, in my opinion at least. The Pokémon are still charmingly animated throughout battle as they were before, but so too now are the NPC trainers, injecting just a little bit more personality into every encounter this game has to offer. Similar to the many bridges from Black and White, new areas like the Marine Tube and redesigned gyms are introduced just to show off the satisfying marriage of traditional sprite art with 3D world design. Climactic moments like the battle against Iris or Kyurem's transformation are also wonderfully presented both in 2D and 3D. 
Speaking of redesigned gyms, every gym now has its own unique rendition of the iconic gym music. Gyms just have an indescribable feeling of grandiosity in this game that I don't think any other Pokemon game has ever been able to match. And that even goes for the more laid-back ones like Marlins. In terms of both art direction and musicality, very few Pokemon games are on the same level as this one. Black 2 and White 2 are also packed with all kinds of extra features to reward players who already played Black and White. The Memory Link exists as a feature to fill in the gaps of the two-year time skip, explaining why certain gym leaders have new roles, how Iris became champion, and what N's feelings were after the ending of the first game. This feature also unlocks the ability to capture N's former Pokémon across the Unova region, and lets you battle against Charon and Bianca using their original teams. Unova Link also allows you to get content from the opposite version, like certain Regis and the Black City or White Forest. And of course, this feature even includes a difficulty system! It's a terribly implemented difficulty system that is needlessly complicated to unlock and use from the beginning, but it exists, so by default it's the best difficulty system in the series. Truthfully, it doesn't change a ton about the game. In challenge mode, gym leaders in Elite Four have one extra Pokemon each, NPC teams can be up to five levels higher than before, and most notable trainers will now be holding items and have improved movesets. But somehow, this barely affects Hugh, who manages to have, like, the worst team of any rival ever for most of the game. The post-game here is also marvelous, and frankly, I would put it on the same level, if not higher, than Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Even in the post-game, you'll find that the old locations of Southeastern Unova have changed quite a bit in only two years. You can even revisit a ton of the areas from the main story to find that there's been new content added in the post-game. Of course, at the top of that list is the Pokemon World Tournament in Driftvale City, which now features every gym leader and champion from past regions. I'll be honest, I fully prefer this to the Battle Frontier. It cuts out the monotonous win against like 50 NPCs in a row crap with three quick battles against notable trainers who were actually fun to challenge. Their teams will even change if you want to battle against them again. If long monotonous battle challenges are your thing though, then there's always the Battle Subway, Black Tower, and White Tree Hollow, which can provide dozens of hours of tough battles. I haven't even mentioned that N gets his own post-game storyline where you can explore the ruins of N's castle, catch his legendary dragon, and unlock monthly battles against N who will use various weather teams against you. These are also the last games where catching all of the post-game legendaries feels oddly fun and less like a chore. Starting with Oras and continuing into Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon, Sword and Shield, and BDSP, the past legendaries are all thrown into these weird space-time distortions and it just feels like a joyless gauntlet to catch them all. Here you actively have to seek out the Lake Trio, Cresselia, Heatran, Latios, Latias, and the Regis. It may not be every legendary in existence, but at least the ones that do come back are handled like proper legendary should be. On the flip side, I do think the Unova region legendaries suffer in this regard. The Swords of Justice are no longer locked away in obscure locations that you have to seek out, rather they just appear before you at various times. Maybe the thought process behind this was that everybody already knew where to find them, so why bother hiding them? But still, I like it more when legendaries are a reward for exploration not just roadblocks that everyone comes across at the same time. And because they want to promote their new 3DS application, Pokemon Dream Radar, Tornadus, Thunderous, and Landorus are not present in the game at all. But at the very least, the game's mascot, Kyurem, I think is handled very well. Unlike the four preceding pairs of legendaries who only show up at the very end in the event of a crisis, Kyurem is the crisis. Before the game has even begun, Team Plasma has already seized Kyurem's power for themselves and is using it to devastate parts of the region. It feels more integral to the plot of the game than most legendaries do, and I really respect the decision to not let the player catch it before the post-game. This is pretty much the only game outside of Kanto where you can't roll into the final battle with an overpowered legendary on your side, and I really like that. Not to mention, this is one of the toughest final stretches that any Pokemon game has, with an incredibly long victory road, a competent Elite Four, and an excellent champion in Iris. But yeah, I really like how Kyurem is more of an active player in this game's story, rather than most legendaries who just show up at the end for the- Now hold on, because it's not all sunshine and rainbows. There's a reason why I said these are the most perfect games, and not straight up perfect games. The final stretch of the game, although challenging, I would still say is a regression compared to Black and White. I really do think that Black and White have the perfect ending. They somehow found a way to roll the Pokemon League, catching the main legendary, and defeating the evil team all into one satisfying conclusion. I know some people would prefer to keep all that separated, but honestly, I think that's the ideal way to keep the end of the game more interesting. 
In Black 2 and Y2, after it gets to Sincurem or defeated, it's just a long slog of Pokemon battles till the end. It's a flaw, but it shares this flaw with basically every other Pokemon game in existence that isn't black and white. And hey, at least the Curem stuff happens after the 8th gym. Most games end up resolving the main conflict just after the 7th gym badge, which is way too early in my opinion. I also think the middle stretch of the game from Chargestone Cave to Lapalucent City is a bit dry on new content. I do think it's cool that we got to explore the much more vast and interesting post-game routes from Black and White, rather than continuing the same path through Icero City. It's still not the ideal way to pace a game in my opinion, but hey, it's still better than most Pokemon titles. Another bummer is that like Black and White, Black 2 and White 2 had a ton of cool online features like Dream World, the GTS, and Trilink, and more that are no longer accessible due to Nintendo shutting down DS Wi-Fi. In fairness, this one really isn't the game's fault, it's just that Nintendo has a habit of going, uh-oh, if these services stay up too long, then we'll only have enough money to stay in business for the next 3,000 years. Fortunately, I would say that at least Black 2 and Y2 didn't put all of their eggs in the online basket that no longer exists. There's still plenty of material to play through without an internet connection, and there are loopholes you can use to even get all the mythicals. So I think this flaw is a little bit overblown by most of the community. A lot of people say that this is Gen 5's Achilles heel, but I simply don't agree with that. If you think you need Drought Ninetales from the Dream World to beat this game, then man, just go play Kirby or something, I don't know what to tell ya. The regional decks could also be somewhat criticized. It was the largest regional decks for its time with 300 species, but the last 25 Pokemon are actually post-game only for some reason, which sadly excludes some cool mons like Toxicroak, Yanmega, and Tyranitar, plus the fossils, Leafeon, and Glaceon aren't obtainable in the main story either. But hey, I'd still take a few missing Pokemon the decks over having extremely limited access to evolution items and other team building options. <coughs> Hot Gold and Soul Silver, Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl. There are also a few returning Pokemon the decks that I would consider duds like Rattata and Skitty, and some really overused ones come back like Zubat, Magikarp, and Psyduck, but by and large, I'd still consider this to be one of the best regional decks out there. And it really is the first regional decks where one type isn't criminally unrepresented either. Because the decks is so well balanced too, you see a lot of team variety from people. Compare this to Kalos, where the decks has 150 more Pokemon, but thanks to the excessive amount of crappy early game fillers and extremely overpowered options, most people's teams end up just looking like this. To an extent, since Black 2 and White 2 ends around level 60 to 65, depending on which mode you play on, it even addresses the complaints that people have about Unova's Pokemon evolving way too late. It doesn't fully fix it, but at least it's possible to get something like Bisharp before you arrive at the Pokemon League. There's even a static level 25 Braviary or Mandibuzz available on Route 4 depending on the version, so you don't have to wait till level 54 if you really enjoy using those Pokemon. They do the same thing with a level 30 Volcarona and the Relic Castle too, negating the need to raise Larvesta all the way to level 59. Again, it's not a dex without its flaws, but I would say it's remarkably well done. It brings back a ton of great Gen 1 through 4 Pokemon, and at least attempts to make some late game Gen 5 Pokemon more accessible. Ultimately, I would say that this dex goes a long way towards making Black 2 and Y2 as enjoyable as they are. Overall, Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 are games stuffed to the brim with content, and there's not just a lot of it, but it's really well-polished content. Content that I think a lot of people didn't even have time to fully appreciate since X and Y came out only a year later. And content that a lot of people didn't even get to experience at all, given that these games only sold about 8 million copies. I know that's still numbers that most franchises would kill for, but this is Pokemon we're talking about. I know there will be people who watch this video who haven't played Black 2 and Y2 before, and if you are, then I would highly recommend you do. Although there are components that, in a vacuum, I think other Pokemon games have done better, such as multiplayer and narrative, I believe that overall Black 2 and White 2 have the most solid core that appeals to the widest amount of Pokemon fans. And I say this despite Black 2 and White 2 not even being my favorite Pokemon games. I actually like Black and White 1 more despite some of their more obvious issues. But nonetheless, I think this is a game most Pokemon fans will confidently rank in the top tier. Before I end this video off, I'd like to give a shout out to my first channel member, my boy Yoshi. Yes, we have channel memberships now if you'd like to support my content even further. It'll give you access to my epic croc themed emojis, a secret discord channel where you can talk directly with me, and I'll probably be doing shout outs at the end of videos like this one. I would appreciate any and all support, I've highly been considering going full time with this, but YouTube is naturally inconsistent as a job, so if you could afford just $5 a month, I'd greatly appreciate it. If not, just a like in this video helps too. 
And of course, if you're not already subscribed, I'd encourage you to do so. I think you're gonna like it here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.